Hi, I'm Chris Klug, the chairman and founder of Chris Klug Foundation, and I'm joined by two uh, very special people, my good friends, Kim Hinesley and Brian Hinesley. Brian is a 20-year uh, liver transplant recipient, former firefighter and uh, first responder and paramedic, and a real hero in the transplant community. Uh, Brian and Kim recently made the move from Southern California to North Carolina and uh, are now including y'all in their uh, regular conversation. So <laughs> nice to see you guys. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'll tell you what, that's probably the biggest thing to learn when you come across the, uh, the country is that y'all is a word and all y'all is more than three. So uh, <laughs> I love but, it. pleasure to be here. My son, River, he wants to hear your story too. Hi. There he is. How are you doing, Brian? How are you guys doing? You healthy and uh, staying active and fit? You know what? We are. We're, we're so happy and healthy here in, in North Carolina. We've been here for a year and a half now. There's a lot to do, uh, not a lot of traffic, so we can ride our mountain bike, our road bikes. We can. There's another one. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hey, we need to go get our kids. <laughs> I love your glasses. Six and nine. You remember these days? Oh my wow. goodness, that was a long time ago, 15 years ago for us to have someone that young, but yeah, it's good times. And, and, and you know, to look at you as, as a father post-transplant is an amazing thing. To be able to raise your kids and do what you do, um, like us, when, when I had my liver transplant 20 years ago, my daughter was three. The biggest fear, one of the biggest fears I had, honestly, and I've, I've told Kim and Megan this, I'll never get to raise my daughter. I don't know how she's going to end up. I won't have any influence in her life um, to show her things that I know that I think are important and to let her know what her dad was like. And, uh, you know, you know, the day of that transplant on March 21st, 2000, when they told me I was going to be okay. And when I woke up and I knew I was going to be okay, so much goes through our minds at that point. I thought more than me living, I'm going to, be Kim's husband again, the real husband, not the sick guy. I'm going to be Megan's dad. With God willing, I'll go back to work as a fireman and a paramedic and do the job that I was born to do. So it's an amazing thing. And to see you with your kids, we're blessed. We're blessed. Your kids are so young. And that donor, the hospital team, our healthcare workers, everybody that had a hand in all of this that has truly made a difference. And not just our lives, but everybody like us. And we're fortunate and blessed to be here today on a beautiful day in North Carolina, looking out at the front yard, 70 degrees, thinking, do I ride my bike or go golfing later? What do I do? Good yeah. problems to have, Brian. <laughs> Hard problems to have. And, yeah, so we're really fortunate, and, and again, to be with you this afternoon and share a little bit uh, with, with the viewers. It means a lot, and it means a lot from somebody who is a small startup like the Clue Foundation putting the message out as anybody in the country and sharing what you have and have, have made for people that, that maybe are, are not as fortunate as us right now and maybe waiting. So it's, it's good to be here today. Well, you've given back and raised a, a great daughter, Megan. And one of the things I really admire about both of you is, is you give back so much to the transplant community and have helped inspire so many people. And, and we've talked about this a lot, I know when I was facing my transplant, it was very scary. I thought it was a death wish initially. And then I realized that, okay, you can survive a transplant, but maybe your quality of life isn't going to be great. And you and I both know that's not the case. I'm healthier and stronger than I ever was before my transplant. You returned to firefighting and, and helping save other people's lives. And uh, you continue to give back in so many ways. I know now you've gotten involved uh, in uh, in North Carolina, your, your new home uh, of uh, just over a year now. Tell me a little bit about why do you keep giving back and, and what does that mean to you guys? You, you know, giving back, it, it, it comes easy. It comes easy to us, to both of us. The way it was hard and one of the inspirations that we got was when we would, how are we going to be? Is my life going to be any what similar to what it was before? And when you'd meet other recipients and say, hey, you know, I, go, I went back to work. I can do this. Um, I'm not as slowed down as I thought I would be. When I would be in the hospital, I thought, if I ever get out of this bed, 
I am going to go back and give back to whoever wants to listen and show, not show off, but show yeah. it's possible. We have a regiment to follow. We have to listen to our health care providers. And we have to take our medicines on a regular basis. In 16 years post-transplant, as a fireman paramedic, I missed two doses of medicine. That's it. And both was because I was on a fire and I didn't have my medicine with me. So giving back and, and giving like we do now, because we were scared and we know they're scared. We were alone. We didn't know then that people were advocating and fighting for us. So that's what we wanted to do. And that's what we wanted to be, was to advocate for them. There's a whole team of people you don't know about. You've yeah. never heard about the Donate Life, the Clue Foundation, your transplant coordinator. We care. You're never alone. And so that's why we're here today. We care. Seems like it's a very similar formula for being an elite fireman, for being a top performing athlete, and for being a healthy, active transplant recipient. Consistency and, and having a routine and a regimen that you implement regularly keeps you safe, keeps you healthy, keeps you performing at a high level. Would you say that's true? 100% true, right? And, and, and that almost goes with anything in, almost anything in life, right? Consistency, a regimen, our sleep, our, our eating patterns, slightly altered from what they were, but better for us. We don't need as much junk as we once did. But, and that's what we advocate to people that they're like, oh my God, all these pills and this. No, no, no. That's part of your regimen now. Take your pills, drink your water, get your rest, eat a healthy diet. Doesn't mean you can't have a piece of cake or a dessert now and then, but not all the time. Exercise to your, the limits that you can. And, and you and I both know that we have done well and our, our bodies have responded so well. And I think one of it is because we have a, 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 a zest for life. We want to exercise. We want to breathe the fresh air. We want to push ourselves. And Life After Transplants allowed us to, to push without being reckless but do things that are fun that I think our donors and our transplant family community, the healthcare providers are proud to see folks like us saying, yeah, those guys are doing it the way they should. Samantha Rose, she's doing it the way she should with those lungs, pumping them full of air as hard as she can. Representing yeah. indeed. Yes, sir. So, so yeah, so life, you know, that was one of my goals like you when I was waiting if God willing, I'm going back as hard as I came in and I'm going to give back as much as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. What does 20 years out as a transplant recipient look like? Oh, <laughs> my good. Other than losing my hair a few years ago. <laughs> well, mine's turning gray. <laughs> it's those six and nine year olds. <laughs> I remember it was Jeff Black. You didn't have kids. Yeah. <laughs> it's worth the price. It's worth the price. 20 years out as a recipient, I never imagined 20 years. I was hoping, you know, at first you're thinking five years, maybe 10. Do you get retransplanted? Does this thing wear out? We both can attest. You take care of it. We get a good organ. 20 years seems like yesterday. And what we have accomplished in that time, I'm not kidding. We walk, we walk, we walk the golf course. We ride our bikes. We kayak. We do whatever we can. We travel around, we raise our daughter, walk her. If 20 years out is fantastic, don't even have any sign of slowing down or want to slow down because we know we laid on a bed too long, Chris, people yeah. like us. That bed's behind us now. I want to be out and doing it, right? Indeed. Yeah, 20, 20 years out is a good place to be. I, I remember somebody asked me, what's your next goal after I went back to work? And I said, my next goal is to be the longest living liver transplant in the history of the world. Right? <laughs> the longest right living. behind you, as always. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're a month or two apart. Yeah. Um, in our, in our transplant. But yeah, so we set high goals and we expect a lot from ourselves. And it drives us to stay healthy and do the right things. Life after transplant is a car. It's a regimen. Life is a regimen. You talked about sleep taking your medication regularly, adhering to that uh, post-transplant anti-rejection uh, medication protocol, um, 
you know, eating right, sleeping, any other secrets to your success? You know, um, it, a lot of it goes with, say, this, this COVID-19, that staying clean. We, we've been practicing for COVID-19 for 20 years because we've always made sure that we wash. We're, san we're clean in the cleanest environment we possibly can. We, we cook a lot at home. We put the food right away. Um, if somebody says they're sick, we may not go over, well, we will not go over their house when they're sick. We, we've taken some precautions along with our regimen of medication and eating and sleeping properly. So just maintaining a healthy lifestyle, we're, we're what we're all doing, told, being told to do today, we've been doing it since the day after our transplant because that's what they told us is one of the keys to living a long time. See, one thing we do more than other people is we see a doctor more regularly and get lab work more regularly. So if anything goes sideways, we know almost pinpoint the day it went sideways because of our follow-up care. And we have to be our own best advocate. And if we're not feeling well, I don't know about you, but I'm the mo not the most honest if I don't feel well. <laughs> Give it a week or two. So we, we, we've been taught to be a little more honest when we're not feeling good, just to make sure that we're not fake. So, so yeah, so I, I think that's one of the key. In all relationships. <laughs> yeah, it just, we're, we're kind of hard headed and I imagine you might be like me. You don't want to ever say I'm, I'm falling behind or I'm a little puny today. I'm always a hundred percent. I love it. <laughs> What's your perspective as a lifelong fireman and, and also as a transplant recipient? Um, you were a fireman in, in LA County for many, many years and both prior to your transplant and, and post transplant and also first responder and, and a paramedic. What, what do you make of what's going on in the world right now as it relates to COVID-19? You know, it, it's devastating to see, well, one, the loss of life, um, the loss of jobs, the despair that people have. But Kim and I and Megan, we talk about this a lot at home. We're a wonderful country and we will band together and we'll help each other through this. It's a hard time now. We've got, this country's gone through a hard time, but when we band together, we're gonna learn a lot from this. We're gonna learn about how to stay a little bit cleaner, how to prepare our food at home, uh, maybe not go out to eat as much, and we know exactly what's going into our food. How not to go interact with people when they're sick, because things can, immunosuppressed or not, make us sick. So keep our body as strong and healthy as possible. Don't be afraid of the outdoors, but just know that we have to take certain measures to go appreciate the outdoors. And we've talked about this before, that we're hugging people. When I see you and your, your wife and your family, we all hug and we shake hands. We, we sit close and we share stories because we appreciate each other. The social distancing thing for people like that is going to be hard. And I'm going to tell you right now, the next time I see you in person, I'll, I'll give you a big old hug. <laughs> So, as long as you don't give me a sloppy wet kiss, we're fine. <laughs> we got a deal on that one. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I think right now this is a, it's a hard and trying time, but this is a hard and tough country too. And we're resilient. We're going to learn a lot from it. We're going to come out on the back end of it better. Um, we do have learned our neighbor around here. She's a little bit older. We've been helping her with some things around her house and other people because service people don't want to come out and this and that. So we're learning how to give more as a community. And I think it's good. We're learning how to get out and enjoy outside because we're tired of being inside. So it's hard and my heart breaks. My heart goes out to all the first responders and healthcare workers because they know any time they could be exposed to this. And if they're not strong enough to fight it off, it could make them ill. But that was also part of the healthcare and first responder job that we see sick people. So, uh, yeah, it's tough times, but I think we'll come out of it good. I honestly do. I do too. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And, uh, prayers are with all your brothers and sisters on the front lines in Southern California and across our whole country and across yes, the whole so world for that matter. The whole world. Yeah. yeah. It's a, we're all in this together. And we're all going to come out of it is, 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 I think, better on the back end. But thank you for those uh, thoughts and prayers. And I'll relay those to my friends. There are some silver linings in this. You know, I'm loving more time with my kids and my wife, Missy, and a chance for us to pause and reflect on what's important in life, most important in life for that matter. 
and right. uh, you know a great chance to reconnect with good friends like you guys and so grateful for this opportunity to catch up with you guys today yeah and, and you know one of the, the the side effects that might come from this is that you're you're in aspen and we're in north carolina and getting to each other even on a good day is hard it's, it's not the easiest thing but, but if we can connect more and doing some virtual things with uh support groups on ambassador tours this might be a silver lining that comes out of it. Yes. Yeah. The Klug Foundation with their ambassadors, uh, Samantha and all the other ambassadors that you have, Jim O'Brien, that we can all talk and then share our stories virtually with other recipients and healthcare workers. It might be a silver lining there, brother. Oh, I think you're right. And you guys joined us for a great tour in San Diego uh, with our Chris Klug Foundation ambassador panel tour. And we had some very powerful events there. Can you uh, talk about that for a second? Because uh, I was there and, and loved being a part of it and teaming up with both of you. We were blown away. We, we, we've spoken before, and as you know, we've spoken around quite a bit, but that was a powerful team. Once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> Once or twice and shared a, a story or two. But when we went down to San Diego with the, the Ronald McDonald House with the kids and the other transplant centers and the healthcare workers and the, the patient post and pre transplant, there was energy in the room and we heard it from the people in the room, yeah. whether it be the healthcare providers or the patients, that what the energy the Klug Foundation on the ambassador tour did to hear our stories and share our energy. It, it was fantastic. If, if people could ever join in and something like that, they'd be blown away because the energy that's brought by the ambassadors who have been through so much and want to give back so much to these people who are waiting, to the parents who are scared for their kids, to the little, the, the young lady who just had her transplant a week or two ago and couldn't wait to hug you and had been waiting all week when she heard you were coming. It brings a tear to your eye because she looks at you and says, my goodness, Chris did this, Brian did that, Samantha Rose as another ambassador with her lungs, she's doing this. The ambassador tour was amazing in San Diego, all of those events. We didn't want it to end, but honestly, after two or three days, we were exhausted emotionally from those stories and all that energy that we were given and receiving, but uh, it, it was just a fantastic weekend with the Clue Foundation as a bounce back, give back ambassador. Uh, Kim and I, we had a ball. We had a ball. We loved having you guys and look forward to doing it again. It may be virtually later this summer and this fall, but uh, at some point we're coming to you and we're going to uh, tour some transplant centers in the oh, uh, Southeast and the North Carolina area together. Yeah, and there, there's a, you know, a few transplant centers out here at UNC and at Duke and over in Charlotte. And uh, we've already spoken at uh, UNC right after my transplant. I met my doctor and uh, he says, wow, you, you know, he, he was, it was a 10 minute uh, uh, appointment that turned into an hour <laughs> and he became enamored with the way Kim and I spoke and what we spoke about to the point where he said, hey, I have 400 students I would like you to speak to on a panel with him. And these kids ate it up. They, they love what the transplant's about. There's a lot of misconceptions that we can, a lot of these students thought, hey, I thought after transplant you were pretty sedentary. And they see me bouncing around like a knucklehead. <laughs> Not exactly. Oh. <laughs> so, so yeah, so there's so much opportunity in these centers, uh, when, just in North Carolina alone, there's three that we know of that, uh, and it doesn't have to be liver, it's all, all, all recipients of anything that, uh, there's some good things out there. And if you come make it out here, we'd be more than happy to accompany you and uh, share our story in person with people that are comfortable in person. Maybe it's a year or two years from now. We're in as there. As long as I bring my kite boards and you'll go to the Outer Banks with me for a few days, I'm there. We're in. We're in. Kim, <laughs> Kim will stay on the ground and uh, stay the way, but I'll be up there with you, pal. I'll be up there. <laughs> Kim, you nominated Brian for the 2018 Chris Kluge Foundation Give Back, uh, Bounce Back Give Back Award. And uh, you guys got to come out to Aspen as our recipients in 2018. First of all, why did you nominate him? And then maybe you can share a little bit about what that experience was like. I nominated Brian for the Bounce Back Give Back Award because 
Brian has the biggest heart of anybody that I've ever met. Most unselfish person. He's very humble. He does like I any agree. recognition about this. Um, but he gives back to so many people from just patients that he does that he works with, you know, as firefighter, paramedic. He um, going into a situation with the fire department on a call. Uh, the patient is is in need of a liver transplant. The, the family members explaining to Brian, I know you don't know anything about this, but he needs a liver transplant. So, but Brian just dives right in there, lets him know I'm with you and you're not alone. He's given back so much just in every area of his life that I felt like he needs to be recognized as he gives back more than anybody I've ever met, just from anything, from just giving back, just from helping people in the community, just, you know, being at a phone call. We've gone to people's homes and sat with people. We've been in the ICU with patients who are scared to death that don't have much longer. So that's why I nominated him. And our experience in Aspen, incredible. When you climb that mountain, oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> You, you mean the one where Chris says, hey, it's a little hike up there. Just, <laughs> just a little hike up there. You made it look easy, Brian. <laughs> Hold yeah. on to you. But, and, and you know, when I won, I didn't know I was nominated. And when your office, Lauren, called and says you won, I was, I actually was, what did I win? <laughs> I, I had no clue I was nominated. And when she explained it to me, I, I put the pieces together pretty quick and thought, my wife has something to do with this, doesn't she? <laughs> they always do, so, don't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're always the last to know. And I was elated. Um, of awards that I've won, I've been presented or, or recommended for, this one was by far the greatest. It means something. To me, my life is about transplant recipients, healthcare providers, getting people who are scared, who, who, who have questions, that maybe doctors can't answer, that only recipients can answer. We've been on that road. Yeah. And to be nominated by the foundation as a, as a recipient of the Bounce Back Give Back, I was blown away. Absolutely blown away. Could not wait to go and interact with everybody in Aspen, which again was incredible. The whole community, I mean the whole community was around it. At, at, your, at your dinner that night, all your sponsors were genuine. They had questions. They had wonderful insight. It, we could have asked for anything better, nor could we have expected anything that we saw or were part of. So it, it was wonderful. And I thank Kim for nominating me. That I am embarrassed to win things, but that was a fantastic moment that I'll never forget. Well, after his transplant, after we get him home, and he said, I need to give back. And I said, well, right now you need to get well, so let's work on that. And, but he just wanted, that was his words. I need to get back. And he goes, my goal is to get rid of the list. I don't want anybody waiting on the list anymore. Yeah. So we need to just go out there and, and just educate and inspire. We didn't even have, we weren't involved with anybody yet. No, then we got involved with one legacy and start, but then that film came, our film came out. Um, and that's when we started speaking all over the country mm -hmm. about this. And as, as a caregiver, I just want to be, I want so I and I've had many people call and say I need I don't I, I need someone to talk to because no one understands and I do so, so that's why we get back that's yeah. why I nominated him yeah it was almost a team victory here our award bounce back <laughs> give back we did it together I love it well that's how it is you know it's uh, you need a great partner in life and you certainly have one we, we do and. We realized this a long time ago. You can't get through this alone. You can't get through life alone, <clears throat> let alone a transplant. You need not only your, your family, your friends, but your caregivers, and you have to follow instructions, and you have to work as a team. And working as a team and, and being team people, it, at first it's kind of hard, but you adapt quickly, and you say, this is for life. If I don't do this, I'm not going to survive. So it puts it in perspective and now it's very simple but as we do anything we realize it's a team and there's people out there we don't know that you don't know that we're going to be introduced to and we're part of their team now to help them up the next leg of their journey and probably become lifelong friends and acquaintances that uh, we're there we're there for each other so it's absolutely that's one of my mantras you don't win an olympic medal without a great team 
and you don't get through a life-saving liver transplant without a great team. And uh, Wonderful. we know that uh, better than most. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We, and we're fortunate. Somebody once asked, and I don't know about you, Chris, he says, you know, if you had it over to do it again, would you not have this liver transplant? I would. I didn't like what I went through. We were both very sick. It was a very trying time on, uh, on me as a person and us as a, a family. But where we've gone since and what we've learned about life and how valuable and precious it is and the friends we've met along the way, I wouldn't give it up. I, I'm glad we've done the road that we've done and we're at a place where we should be now. And I'm, I'm proud to be here. I, don't I probably know. never would have met you. You know? Yeah. So Thank you. I'm proud to be here too and proud to uh, partner with you guys. Now, Brian, I understand yeah. you just had a, a birthday. And uh, <laughs> uh, you know what? It's a little more special 20 years out from a transplant. It's incredible because you never thought, you know, at 40, I'm never going to see 41. It, I don't celebrate my birthday. I went out golfing with my buddy and then I did some. Uh, we did some moving up dirt at his house. He didn't know the whole day that it was my birthday. My daughter posted something on Facebook and he calls up. He says, Hey, I just worked you like a dog after we golf. And I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't know it was your birthday. And my birthday is special. Don't get me wrong. My mom and me had that connection and that that's my birthday, but my liver transplant anniversary. I remember, I don't remember my day of birth. But my liver transplant anniversary, March 21st, 2000, I remember that day vividly. And that's a day that's huge, huge in my life. And, and we talk about that a lot. We celebrate the birthday here, but I don't ever mention it to other people. One, I don't like attention on myself. But yeah, the birthday, 61, 21 years post-transplant uh, this March, it's incredible. Who would have ever thought it? Or 20 years ago. Post transplant. I'm sorry. Yeah, 61 years old. Yeah. Well, happy it's birthday to you! Congrats on 20 years. I'm glad you're doing so well. You guys look awesome, and uh, as always, love catching up with you. Is there anything else you'd like to share as we wrap up our conversation this afternoon? You know, it, it being part of this community and part of the Clue Foundation with all the other big foundations and the the donate lives and all that out there. What we love most here is that you can get a hold of Chris Clue and you can get on his website and you can navigate it without a bunch of awkwardness because we try to navigate some of the other spots. And to actually know the founder who's lived through this and is still passionate like we are 20 years ago, for those that are nominated and don't win, bounce back, give back, somebody thought high enough of you to hold you in that esteem and you're a winner with that there's only two a year that win but even if you don't win and you've been nominated or even thought of you're a winner and we've done an incredible journey post transplant so as a as a collective family we're a special group whether or not we win an award or not we're, we're a pretty elite group and when we see each other we know it because i know you're the same as me you had a transplant? You go right to that person. Hey, what'd you have? Tell me about it. We get excited for them because we know what they went through. It's a special family that we're part of and being part of the Clue family is a very special thing for us. And it's been a pleasure this last few minutes to share, share and catch up a little bit with you, Pat. It's, it's, it's always great fun. seeing you guys. I love you guys. And uh, thank you for all you continue to do to, to help other people. You're uh, our pleasure, Chris. To me and so many people in the transplant community. It feels great. You look wonderful. Love Until you. we see you in the future, there's my big hug Hi. to you. <laughs> Virtual hug. <laughs> right on, brother. Great catching up with you again. Yeah, you too. I love you guys. Stay healthy and uh, wish uh, Megan, your daughter, well for us. And I can't wait to see you again soon. Happy springtime. <laughs>